So as Erica introduced, I'm Venus. I'm a psychology student at UW, and I'm also the president of NTech. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm in pharmacy. I'm the VP of admissions. Uh, I'm Nathan. I'm a fourth year kinesiology student, and I'm, I'm the VP of knowledge translation. So today, we're going to be talking about the digital divide, barriers and predictors to technology use, and how technology can be used to help older adults manage their health. Um, Nathan will then talk about social isolation and NTEC's mission, and then Peter will talk about interventions in technology literacy. So first, I'm going to talk about the digital divide, which is basically the phenomenon that a lot less older adults use technology than other age groups. So how frequently do older adults use technology? <coughs> um, over the last two decades, a lot more older adults have started using technology. As you can see in 2016, 67% of older adults use the internet, whereas in 2000, only 12% of older adults use the internet. So that's a 55% increase over the 16 years. And similarly, with smartphone and social media use, um, the the use has increased significantly. So 4 in 10 older adults have used smartphones in 2016, and 3 in 10 older adults use social media in 2016. So even though their use has increased significantly over the last two decades, their use still lags behind all other age groups. Because as you can see, the light blue line, which is all adults 18 and over, 90% of them use the internet, whereas only 67% of older adults use the internet. And again, similar things are shown with smartphone and social media use. So for those older adults that do use technology, they most commonly use cell phones and computers, and a smaller proportion of older adults use smartphones and tablets. And that's most likely because smartphones and tablets are newer devices, so they're not that familiar with it and they tend to stick with more um, older devices. And also in this chart, I don't know if you can see, but the lighter, um, the lighter bars are all adults 18 plus. Again, you can see that a lot more adults from other age groups use technology more than older adults. So even if you just look at those who are over 65, you can see that there are differences in technology use based on age. So if you look at the chart, as you increase in age, the use of technology decreases rapidly. So those who are 65 to 69 are twice as likely to use the internet than those who are 80 plus. And those who are 65 to 69 are three times as likely to own a smartphone than those who are 80 and above. That's OK. So basically, like this is a summary slide from the above section, is basically even though older adults are using technology a lot more often than before, their use still lags behind all other age groups. So next, I'm going to be talking about some barriers that older adults face with technology use. So lack of education is a really important barrier to older adults because this affects um, purchasing, using, and troubleshooting technology. So without someone there to continuously support them, they often, um, whenever a problem arises, they're kind of discouraged to continue using technology. Physic de physical decline is also a really important barrier um, since that comes with age. So here I have some examples of functional impairments that older adults might experience. So arthritis or joint pain, Older adults might find that they have difficulty with typing if they have that. And some older adults experience decreased mobility, which might make it difficult to use a mouse to double click or scroll around. And decreased perception of the physical environment is another um, functional impairment that they might experience. So this might lead to decreased touch sensitivity, which would make it hard to do things like tapping small buttons on your phones or using a keyboard. And cognitive decline is also a barrier to technology um, because using new, te new technology often requires learning new skills. So um, cognitive decline, like processing speed and memory decline, would really make it hard for older adults to learn new skills. And technophobia is another word for computer anxiety. So a lot of older adults tend to imagine negative scenarios of using technology, such as appearing stupid because they don't know what to do, or they might feel like they might accidentally damage equipment since they're not sure what they're doing. 
And the last two barriers are perceived lack of need and stereotype threat. So I'm going to talk about those two more in detail. So um, perceived lack of need is actually pretty common among older adults where they feel that they don't need technology, it won't be useful for them. But a study actually found that this attitude of not needing technology actually decreased as technology became older and more familiar to the older adult. So as you can see in this chart, a lower percentage of older adults felt that cell phones and computers were not needed, whereas a higher percentage of older adults felt that tablets and e-readers were not needed. And again, this is probably because tablets and e-readers are more recently introduced devices, so older adults might not know enough about it to find them useful. And this slide, I want to talk about stereotypes, and more specifically, the stereotype that technology is often associated with younger generations. So this study basically asked participants to rate how old they felt before and after using an application, and participants either used a familiar or an unfamiliar application. The familiar application was Waze, and the unfamiliar application was Booking. And what they found was that older adults rated themselves as older after using either application, but this effect was exaggerated with the unfamiliar application. So basically what this means is that um, older adults may have felt more incompetent after using technology because they may have thought of stereotypes that um, technology is often for younger people and not for them. So this is a really good example of how stereotypes can prevent older adults from using technology. So next, I'm going to be talking about some predictors of technology use. So um, the higher the education and income level for the older adult, the more likely they are to be using technology. Also, a large social network um, predicts um, technology use because um, family and friends are more likely to provide emotional and practical support for using technology. And also, um, older adults are Older adults often communicate with their family and friends through technology, so that gives them a sense that technology is actually useful in their lives. And also, technology use is tied to age cohorts, which means that younger individuals consistently use technology more often than older individuals. And this stays true even if that older inv individual used technology really often when they were young. So basically, as you go older, you're less likely to adopt to newer technologies. And then finally, in this section, I'm going to talk about how technology can help support older adults in managing their health. So um, we've kind of had a, a shift in the healthcare models over like the last few decades. Um, traditionally, the healthcare model was where like the doctors were mainly the experts, and they kind of gave you orders that you were supposed to follow. Um, the problem with this was that sometimes what the doctor doctors gave as orders was not what the patients, um, the patients weren't that internally motivated to achieve them. So we have shifted towards more of a patient professional partnership where both the patient and the doctor works towards goals together. So this new model gives more responsibility to older adults and patients in general to take more responsibility in managing their own health. Um, and this model also recognizes that patients make their own decisions regarding health um, and they don't always align with what the doctors order. So um, when they go home, do, uh, patients can make like any decision regarding their health, such as what they eat, if they wanna exercise, and if they even wanna take their medication or not. So basically with this model, um, patients set their own goals, such as, um, for example, if the doctor advises limiting fat in their diet, maybe they should work towards um, cutting cheese consumption to maybe just twice a week or something, instead of cutting it out fully. So with this shift in like healthcare with like a greater responsibility on patients to manage their own health, um, electronic health resources can help older adults in managing their chronic conditions. And electronic health resources are things like internet or email. Um, and electronic health resources can help older adults find other people through forums that also have similar health conditions. They can find health services online. They can communicate with a healthcare provider through email, and they can also make better informed health decisions since the internet has so much information about treatments and medical conditions. But the problem with this is that most older adults don't take advantage of the benefits of e-health resources due to many of the barriers that we talked about before. 
So it is really important for us to have some programs or interventions that target some of the barriers before in order for older adults to take advantage of the different resources we have online. So that's basically what our club does. We go out in the community and we teach older adults um, how to use technology. And so we're basically targeting the lack of education barrier. But by teaching older adults how to use technology, we're kind of also targeting the computer anxiety and the perceived lack of need barriers. Since usually when we, we find that when we um, support older adults in using technology, they kind of change their attitude towards technology also. So this is a good segue into Nathan's presentation where he talks about NTech and its impact we have on the community. So Venus started to dabble into a little bit of what our mission as NTech is. And one of that is trying to prevent that barrier of technological literacy and trying to prevent that um, from, prevent older adults from um, not, not being engaged with technology. And another issue that we tried to look into was social isolation in older adults. Um, so how does social isolation impact health in older adults? And in order to like, fully understand its health implication, we need to know what social isolation is. So right off the slide, social isolation is a state in which the individual lacks a sense of belonging, engagement with others, has a minimal number of social contacts, and are deficient in fulfilling and quality relationships. So I think one, uh, one thing people start to misunderstand about social isolation is that they confuse it with loneliness. So social isolation is more objective, and loneliness is more subjective. So uh, we use the example of older adults. So they're more prone to social isolation because uh, a lot of them are placed in retirement homes. And a lot of these retirement homes, they live in single rooms or in double rooms, and that kind of reduces their social network a little bit. So they are physically unable to um, kind of engage in other social relationships. Rather, uh, compared to loneliness, that is a state of being alone. So I could be in my room by myself and say that I'm lonely, um, but that doesn't really prevent me from going out and making my own social connections. But compared to someone who is a little bit older than I am, um, they are physically unable to do so. So why does it matter? So social isolation is starting to become a hot topic in the industry of aging because it's starting to become correlated with other diseases or disorders uh, that are prevalent in that population. So it's a little hard to see, but in the middle I have social, social isolation in older adults. And something that I found out recently that kind of shocked me was that it has a similar it has similar impacts on morbidity as lifestyle choices such as smoking and alcohol. So you can kind of imagine like what smoking and alcohol does to you physiologically and biologically, um, you can kind of compare that to social isolation. So you can see how um, kind of how that's kind of starting to become a phenomenon uh, in, in these coming times. It's also increased the risk of dementia and also increased risk of hypertension, which leads to cardiovascular diseases in older adults. So this study is something that I wanted to share. Um, so basically, I want you to draw your attention to the graph on the left. So those are, those are older adults who were in the condition of being uh, socially isolated. And what they tried to measure was their gait speed. So if you don't know what a gait speed is, it's basically how fast you walk. And if you are wondering, like, why does it matter how fast we walk, it's actually a pretty good predictor of how well someone is able to perform activities of daily living. So based on how fast I walk, you can predict how well I can get out of bed, how well I can go back to bed, how well I can stand up, doesn't matter. So that is something that they tried to look into um, and kind of give us an indication of how they're doing uh, phys uh, physically um, with their health. So there are three lines, three points of data that I want you to focus on. So the top solid line is people who are high in socioeconomic status, which means that they are uh, more accessible to different resources that can help with their health and also their social isolation. And then just below that are people who are considered middle class, and just below them are people who are considered to have a low socioeconomic status. So you can see people who are richer in this sense and more, have more access to different resources have initially a higher gait speed and also maintain that throughout um, weeks of social isolation. But as you kind of follow the trend a little bit, as you decrease in socioeconomic status, you lose access to resources, you have a lower uh, gait speed initially, and then you have a faster decline as well. So that can kind of, you can kind of like take that with how you want it, but to me, I think that's a good indication of like social isolation is something that needs to be considered and there are definitely interventions out there. We just got to go out there and find it. Um, so that is basically how NTech was formed. 
Um, so they wanted to use, or we wanted to use technology in order to break that barrier, in order to break that barrier of social isolation, and hopefully uh, you know, stimulate someone's health in that older population. Um, so yeah. So just a question for you guys, what forms of technology do you use in order to stay connected with your family? Like a lot of us live away from home. I talk to my parents almost every day. What do you guys use to like stay connected with your family? Yeah. My specifically FaceTime so I can talk to them. Yeah, right on. FaceTime. What else? WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Anyone else? Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, so there's, there's tons of things out there. Um, and I think that was the basis of why we started Entech is because technology, people look at it as a bad thing, people look at it as a good thing. And our co-founders, uh, Colin and Dr. Huang, they looked at technology as a good thing. And they saw it as a way to prevent that barrier of being socially isolated, to stay connected with the world and stay connected with our family so that it could positively stimulate our mental health and also our overall health as well. So with that being said, they started Entech back in the fall of 2015. And I know a lot of you guys have been coming to the lectures, um, but I'm not sure of how how many of you guys actually know what Entech is. So I'm just going to explain, give you like an elevator pitch of what it is. So Entech basically stands for engaging in technology. So we help others engage with different kinds of technology, whether it be email, Facebook, FaceTime, all those great things that you guys said. And we aim to improve the lives of those within the Waterloo community. So we do a lot of great work in Schlegel Villages, which is a retirement home that's actually down the road. And we, recently, we uh, got a gig at the Grand River Hospital um, in the cancer suite helping chemotherapy patients um, engage with technology and hopefully take their mind off um, some hard times. And my favorite point about Entech is that we are comprised of different students from different backgrounds, different programs, and different ages. Um, so I, I mean, you guys are in psychology and you're in pharmacy. I know someone in math. It's great. We all come together, but we have one mission. Um, and that mission is to bring service to our community, uh, which is stated here. So our actual mission is through the creation of tools, outreach with the community, and working directly in the community, we aim to provide the resources, education, and tools to help everyone feel comfortable using 21st century technology. Okay? So that kind of leads us to our internal structure of how we work. So we have the instruction division. So these are the volunteers that actually go out into Schlegel Villages or Grand River Hospital, and they teach our older adults and our uh, chemotherapy patients of how to use technology. Next, we have the knowledge translation and curriculum. So these are the people that focus on creating lesson plans. Uh, you know, we have to realize that everybody's different in how they learn. Um, I don't know if you ever taught your mom or your dad how to use Facebook or how to use a printer. My mom asks me all the time. It's different. The way, I, the way I'd explain to you how to use a printer or Facebook is different than the way I would describe to my mom. So that is something that we consider at Entech as well. We are working with different populations. They learn in different ways. They learn in different methods. And we are trying to deliver the best effective way uh, to give that information as possible. And lastly, we have outreach. So um, like I said, Dr. Huang and, and Colin Whaley, they had this idea of technology being a good thing for the world to help us stay connected with each other, with our loved ones, and hopefully positively stimulate our mental health. And that's something that we want to share with the rest of the community. So we go out to different events and we, we advocate the use of technology and we advocate the use of these different um, uh, methods and these mediums to uh, help us stay connected. So I kind of just want to give a shout out to our volunteers that go to these two places, our Schlegel Villages and Grand River Hospital. They're doing great work. Um, some of them are here. So I just want to, first of all, congratulate you. Thank you for doing all that you do. If you guys are interested in joining or learning more of how we do it, uh, why we do it, uh, we're available after the lecture to answer any questions. But this is the main reason why we started Entech. This is, this is, this is our why. Um, and I want you guys to keep that in mind because everyone has their own why. You just got to find that. You just got to find the right people to do it with. And you got to look within yourself to find that skill set in order to do what you want to do. And our vision to end, end things off is that our world, we want to see a world where everyone has the means, support, and tools to engage with technology. So um, Entech is, that, that's, what, that's what we strive for in Entech. Um, and then Peter is going to talk a little bit more how we're doing that um, and the impacts that it had in, on the community. All right, so interventions and technology literacy. As Venus previously mentioned, by improving senior use of technology, we're basically having indirect impacts on a patient's health. I usually like to look at things from a very healthcare perspective being in pharmacy, so I'm gonna show you guys why this matters so much. As you guys know from your previous lectures, 
um, senior populations are increasing dramatically, right? Which is fine, but when you look at the healthcare costs per patient, you can see that it rises dramatically the faster they age. So I know these numbers are very small, so I'm gonna show you guys, um, read them out to you guys. So basically, I'm assuming most of you guys here are between the ages of 20 to 24. You are using roughly $1,500 every year on healthcare. As soon as you reach the senior age, you're using upwards of $30,000. And this is just because these senior populations are very complex patients. As you age, you're basically getting deteriorating health, and now you're starting to develop multiple conditions which needs multiple healthcare providers in order to provide your care. So maybe they're going to need 24-7 long-term care support, or maybe they're getting ER hospitalization. It also creates a huge cost on drugs, just because again, with the amount of conditions they have, they're eventually getting polypharmacy, where they're using a bunch of different drugs in order to treat all their conditions. So considering these healthcare costs are already increasing rapidly, we begin to see that this system is just not sustainable and that some sort of change is needed. So again, as Venus showed before, we are going to be introducing technology. Um, not only is this going to improve the health of individuals through being able to have them interact with the technology systems, but it's also going to allow them to have reduced senior isolation through communicating with other members in their family, friends, and so on. So at this point, we need to really determine what kind of aspects are important or interventions are important um, and which are the best in terms of improving their health, in terms of reducing senior isolation, teaching them technology, and so on. So here I have a list of five different interventions. There's a lot more, of course, but due to time limits today, I'm only going to be able to talk about a few. Um, I'm going to start by defining each one very quickly. Um, and just to make this presentation more interactive for you guys, I want you guys to start listing them in your mind, the order from least effective to most effective in terms of reducing senior isolation. So not improving the health of the individual, but in terms of reducing how they feel about being isolated from society. And then I'll be presenting in that order of least to most effective. Um, so this rating that was used was developed by the School of Psychology in Hampshire, and it basically looks at their reduced um, social isolation through both quantitative and qualitative methods, such as surveys, and it also looks at the study designs of different trials and how appropriate it was. So our first um, intervention is video games. So basically, they're getting the senior to play games. Telecare is essentially providing them with the opportunity to interact with other healthcare professionals through, um, for instance, phone calling or video calls. Um, we have general ICT, and that's basically uh, introducing them to computer and internet use. We have robotics interventions, so you're getting robots to interact with the seniors. And then we're going to have 3D virtual reality, where the individual has access to that technology um, acting as an avatar with other participants. I'd also like to mention that I make a reference to a lot of products within these slides. I'm not necessarily endorsing them by any means, but I just wanted you guys to get like an idea of what's happening in the real world um, so that you can, can create a connection between it. So the least effective is actually 3D virtual reality. Um, so in this, in this intervention, they're basically going into an environment and they're acting as an avatar and they're basically socializing with other people. And the really nice thing about this intervention is that it's, it can be used for low mobility individuals because you don't really need to go anywhere to do it. You can interact with other people from quite a distance. Um, and through that, they're able to achieve emotional support and reduce their senior isolation. So while it is the least effective, it is going to be still effective in terms of having some benefit. So one interesting adaptation of this technology is called Rendever. And basically, it allows the seniors to use VR technology in order to, for instance, um, explore Paris. So eventually, essentially, these creators created these environments where they're able to explore the town of Paris or maybe go, go on a hot air balloon ride and so on. So the studies that have been done on this, very limited, just because it is, up and, it is an up and coming technology. And also the studies have relatively low sample sizes. So we're not completely sure about it. Um, but in terms of the benefits, again, I, as I mentioned before, a little bit of reducing social isolation and depression. Unfortunately, it doesn't have much other effect in this. So it's not going to improve their health in any manner compared to the other interventions. So as a bottom line, 3D virtual reality is something that we can definitely accept. Maybe we can even recommend it. But it's something that we should study more before we actually implement it, just because it has a high price barrier associated with it. And there's so many different virtual reality systems that haven't been studied. Um, and we don't know which one is effective and which one isn't. So the 
Next intervention is actually the robotics intervention. So it's basically designed as another companionship type aspect. A little interesting to me, the fact that um, virtual reality, you're interacting with another person, but robotics happen to be higher. You're interacting with a robot, which I found kind of neat. Um, so there's two kinds of robots that they introduced in this intervention. The first is your pet robot. So it's very similar to animal assisted therapy, but it doesn't have the costs associated with like maintaining the animal or like the risk of infection um, that are carried on animals. Um, we also have the relational agent. So this is basically a robot that acts as a conversational agent. So for instance, um, it's going to have talk therapy. So essentially, the senior interacts with the robot on and on. And through these interactions, it basically tries to think of what is going to be the um, best way to interact with a senior. And it's going to adjust its responses based on that. So sort of like your Spotify playlist, how you like a song, and it changes based, your recommended changes based on that. Um, the relational agents, there's a variety of types. So it can include like a physical robot, it can be a computer, or it can be like a fit tracker. As a complete aside, I'd like to talk more about the pet robot since, again, I found it a little interesting. Um, can you guys tell me what animal you guys think this pet robot is going to be? I'm hearing dog. Anything else? Cat, OK. So interestingly enough, the animal is a baby seal. And it actually looks like a stuffed animal. Paro is a therapeutic robot developed by IST and available from Intelligent System Corporation. Paro, modeled on a baby harp seal, displays emotional responses to external stimuli, which are input via a range of tactile, light, audio, and temperature sensors. Paro is designed to have a positive psychological effect on people who interact with it. で、パラには価値観として、ま、撫でられると心地よい、ま、叩かれると嫌だ。ま、そういう価値観がありまして、それで飼い主との中、あの、関係の中で、ま、前に撫でられた行動を出やすくしていくということで、飼い主の好みの
Raise your hand if you think it's general ICT. You guys are dead. Raise your hands, guys. <laughs> Video games. General ICT. All right, so it seems like we have a majority for general ICT. Surprisingly enough, the intervention that is the top is actually video games. So that's right, you can go get your grandparents to like play some games now or something. Um, games are actually a very legitimate way of reducing social isolation and has been used in a variety of other aspects. So think about the times you use games in your education, your training, and so on. In terms of the games used um, in this study, they were called extra games, which is basically something similar to Wii Sports. So you're having exercising and gaming at the same time. The theory behind this is that it provides a connection point with other seniors um, to allow them to talk about something on common ground. And it's also going to increase their physical activity. So in terms of the studies that have been done on this, the reason it is at the top is just because there have been very few studies done on it. And based on the ranking criteria, it just happened to make it on the top. Um, so for instance, there was only one randomized control trial done with a sample size of 35. And if you guys have taken a statistics class, you obviously know this is a very, very small sample, and it's not going to be as effective. Um, yeah. So because of that, I suspect that as there are more studies done on this, it's not going to be the top intervention. It's going to reduce, but it still shows um, some prospect of being able to do something. Um, so based, OK. Yes. Uh, the nice thing about the video games is that it's actually going to improve their physical activity and has actually been found to reduce their risk of falls as well. So that's an interesting point. Um, there was also another study done where they examined the improvements in terms of the senior uh, playing by themselves and also playing with another person. And they found that the reduction in social isolation, um, there was not much difference between them, surprisingly. And the reason behind this was that um, in terms of the person playing by themselves, um, they had other people co viewing with them, so watching them ga um, play th the game. And because of that, they were still commenting on the game and providing that community aspect, which really leads me to believe whether it is the video game that's making the intervention or not, or whether it's just the fact that there is something for them to share in between one another. So we can accept, we can recommend this, be just because like getting a Wii nowadays is very cheap and it's going to be at least a source of entertainment for them, um, but definitely needs a lot more research in terms of whether it's a top, top intervention. Intervention. And finally, we have our general ICT. So this is the second most um, best intervention in terms of reducing social isolation. So again, so uh, general ICT is very similar to what NTEC does. So we're basically going to the seniors and we're teaching them how to use the internet and teaching them how to use um, computers. Um, again, the nice thing about this is that it's going to connect them through the world by having them be able to access things like the news or other resources. And it's also going to improve communications with the senior and other people that they're not able to reach. There have been a lot of studies done on general um, ICT, and most of them have been good. But there are a select few studies that have shown mixed results, um, specifically saying that they were not um, statistically significant difference in terms of reducing the social isolation, or they were just negligible. However, looking at these studies myself, I found that maybe they were not of the highest quality. So for instance, one of the studies was they provided the intervention for um, four hours for two weeks to the seniors. And perhaps this one's not an adequate time amount for them to be able to really learn how to use the computers and be able to access it as best they could. Um, so unfortunately, while this doesn't have any direct health on the um, individual's health like uh, telecare does, it does provide benefits to an individual's well-being. So again, being able to have more control over your life, being able to access the resources, the news, and so on. And surprisingly, it also has implications in improving and preventing, de preventing dementia, though this is something that's going to need more research. Um, also, another surprising point was that seniors were very willing and eager co to continue using technology even after the studies were done. So it was found that around almost 75% of the seniors who completed the study continued to use the computers after on. So this really goes to show you that once we have the intervention for them, they're willing to continue using that intervention and they're able to reintegrate into that b barrier. They're able to cross that barrier of technology. So for our general ICT, we're definitely going to be recommending this, accepting it, just because of its relatively low cost. For instance, you can go to a library and access it, and the fact that it's going to improve senior health in a variety of manners. So for instance, even if it doesn't reduce social isolation, at the very least, it's going to allow them to be able to know how to use technology. For instance, being able to use the telecare systems like we mentioned before. So as a conclusion point, in general, all of these interventions throughout this entire presentation, we've really been trying to drive in the benefits with the use of technology improving the lives of seniors. What I hope that you guys take from this presentation is the fact that we need to really begin advocating for the senior 
population to be able to implement these practices. So maybe it is through volunteering with NTEC, doing work in the community. Maybe we're bringing up these issues to the government or policy and to increase the financial support for implementing these technologies, or maybe even developing, the, developing new technologies um, and softwares to suit their needs. Our society is advancing rapidly, and we really need to acknowledge and take action on changing a fading demographic to one that is active within our community, and this will only allow for the continual positive growth of our society.